I would like to give the floor now, or to introduce first, sorry, Alvaro Rodriguez Arrigo, co-founder and managing partner of IGNIA of Mexico. Uh, also, um, we have a representatives from Brazil, as Eduardo Enrique Acholi Campos, governor of Pernambuco, the minister of uh, Development and Social Inclusion of Peru, uh, Michel Lies from Switzerland. And I would like to start by asking a favor from you. Maybe you will find this funny, but I would like you to help me. Trust me. I am going to ask the people who wear glasses to take them off for a minute. Just one second, please. Do it, all of you. And of course, things are different. Maybe you would be able to read or not. Would you be able to go back to your room in the hotel without your glasses? So now you can put your glasses on again. And I would ask you to look at Jordan, because Jordan has found the way of taking care of a group of people who need glasses, but they have done it at affordable prices. This is a product that we consider a given, such as water. And uh, however, glasses can make a big difference for a large number of people. Jordan is an entrepreneur, and uh, he is bringing market solutions to a group of people. And we ask him to describe to our audience what he does and as a social entrepreneur, which have been the obstacles and the factors that have allowed him to reach El Salvador now. Thank you, Gabriela. It's a pleasure to address this uh, esteemed audience and tell you a little bit about Vision Spring and the work that we do. Vision Spring works to provide affordable access to eyewear everywhere. Uh, it started in rural Mexico about 20 years ago. I founded uh, the organization uh, through an experience of meeting a seven-year-old boy. He was a seven-year-old boy from the School for the Blind. And in his life, he thought he was blind. His parents thought he was blind. His whole community thought he was blind. And when we took a look at him, we recognized, in fact, that he wasn't blind, but he just required an extremely strong pair of eyeglasses. I was a lucky person to put those glasses on that boy's face. And at that moment, both of our lives were transformed. He turned from a blind child to a sighted child. And me, for the first time in my life, I really understood that my life had purpose and that I could make a fundamental and profound difference in other people's lives. Since that moment, um, we've been working to spread that goodwill to many more people. Uh, after that moment, I did some research and realized that there were 700 million people in the world who didn't have access to vision services or affordable glasses. And that wasn't only affecting people as profoundly as this seven-year-old boy, but there were hundreds of millions of people who were losing economic productivity. 45-year-old weavers, tailors, artisans, mechanics, barbers, people who earn their living with their eyes and their hands, who could no longer work, all because of a lack of a pair of glasses that I knew I could source in China for less than 50 cents. And what a ridiculous state of affairs that was. School children who were falling out of school, again, not because of any lack of intelligence, but just because they didn't have access to glasses. So we saw these issues and these problems, and we set out to try to create solutions. And we felt that solutions that were really essential were those that had economically viable business models behind them, that there wasn't enough charity to support this kind of scale that needed to, uh, to be enacted. And so we set out to find economically viable business models that could scale through markets and through uh, commercial markets. Uh, we've been working on it for 10 years, lots of challenges. The markets are deeply failed. The access is poor. The awareness of the issue is poor. But we are proud to say that just this year in El Salvador, we've identified a profitable and sustainable business model that are now we're, we're ripe for replication. I'll hold off there, and I'll tell you more about it as the panel goes on, but I want to get to our, our other panelists. ¿Cuáles fueron los obstáculos en ese caso? which were the obstacles you found in the road, up to the point where, where were the obstacles that you found in the road? 
in that journey? Clearly, um, access to capital was a big obstacle. Not only access to capital, but access to the right capital. It's very common for capital to be available to social entrepreneurs, but it's often tied. And so, for instance, we started in India, and someone said, well, that's a wonderful program. Why don't you do that in Bangladesh? Rather than why don't you do that in India in the surrounding uh, communities and scale? So a lot of times organizations that fund social entrepreneurs want to buy program, but not necessarily build institutions. So what's really essential for social enterprises is to have access to unrestricted capital. Just like in the capital markets, a venture capitalist won't go to an entrepreneur and say, I'll invest in your company, I believe in your business plan, I believe in your team, but you can only use my money to build the inf information technology infrastructure to your business. They give the entrepreneur the ability to spend the money how they see fit and what the highest purpose of that capital is. So capital constraints is a big one. Access to the right type of capital in the right amount is a big one. Human capital is another huge obstacle. It's very common, particularly in the developing parts of the world, that a person either has a business mindset or a nonprofit mindset. A social enterprise requires people who can think with their head and act with their heart. And it's very hard to find that type of individual throughout many parts of the world. Um, and so human capital is a big constraint in, in finding, a, finding um, is, or solving these problems. There's lots of other just technical uh, challenges, customs, getting a product from China to, through a port in Bangladesh. It took us 58 signatures from Bangladesh to Miami. It took us nine months to get our first shipment in, in through Bangladesh. And every country has a different customs uh, infrastructure and, and regulations. So there's lots of regulations within countries. There's some countries where you can't even buy reading glasses over the counter. Uh, in America, you can. There's thousands of eye doctors, but in many parts of Latin America, you can't buy a ready-made reading glass, and that locks out hundreds of thousands, millions and millions of people from getting that simple, essential product. So regulations often get in the way. I can go on, but I think that's enough. Uh, yes. Um, bueno, Alvaro, you... Very well, Alvaro. I think the call is for you to talk to us about the different levels of entrepreneurs and the different phases of development and also different ways or systems or forms of looking in this when we're talking about capital. What do you say when you have to support someone like Jordan or Jordan who is truly representing a whole set of entrepreneurs here? What do you say in response? Well, yes, Jordan is an example of, in a certain, to a certain extent, in the tower of people that we're experiencing in the social sector. We have projects such as Vision Spring with a first-rate entrepreneur like Jordan, who has tremendous experience in the business world, and as he says, with a tremendous heart. But we're also hearing from him as well that it's hard, he's hard pressed to find capital. So therefore, where, what's happening? Where, where's the disconnect where you can't find capital with the courage to invest in a project such as Jordan's that, of course, has risks, undoubtedly. Undoubtedly, there are many question marks that have to be resolved. But if they are resolved, if they are overcome, a project such as Jordan's becomes an example, an example where many other entrepreneurs can say, there's a great example. He said there are 700,000 people who don't have access to quality eyeglasses, 700 million people. That's a huge, huge market. Why is there such a huge market? And and Jordan has the opportunity there, and you're not getting it. Regulation, risk, perception of risk, return in Latin America. What has been your experience with that? Undoubtedly, the option of the potential for return is certainly there. Clearly, the capital market, nonetheless, is not seeing that ROI. It's perceived as being extremely high risk. 
One uh, unfortunate impact or side effect that we've had of the financial crisis of 2008-2009 is that we have had a movement toward a much less risk-tolerant world, which is a contradiction. It's the opposite of what we need. We need innovation. We need new ways of doing things. And for those innovations, we need capital that has risk tolerance to but then that's because all of the models are not proven yes that's true of course but i mean the vast minority are proven but then what else are we doing here i mean why are we here if we want to have social innovation if we want to have truly new models to be able to resolve long standing problems i mean the obviously the long standing models haven't worked so that is why we need to, I mean, taking risk doesn't mean being irresponsible. It means that we need to, in a responsible fashion, we need to invest in projects that have a chance, a small chance of changing the world. It will be interesting to see whether people like you can serve to evangelize the investors that are a little bit old school in terms of their thinking. We'll go back to the topic of capital and I ask whether the others have some other thoughts on this topic of capital as well. Let me share that Minister Trivelli and I traveled across parts of Peru through Capachica, Puno, and of course Cusco to hear about the projects that the ministry is creating and launching with a tremendous amount of impact. And I was truly impressed by what you're doing here, Madam Minister. But also, Carolina, I would ask you to, to take a slightly different tack in our discussion here. What can a government do? What can any government do to help a social entrepreneur like Jordan? Gabriela, I think that the role of government and of the public sector in general in how we grapple and address social innovation is two-tiered. One is the promotional role. If we have a problem of risk uh, assessment or a clear assessment of a return on social investment, I think then there's much that the government can do to make those risks visible and to share some of those risks in some cases, particularly to jumpstart programs, not for implementation, but certainly to encourage this initial investment that a lot of social innovations require to be able to make that first leap forward. And there's also a possibility of human capital, but also to make these projects more visible and make the environment more conducive for innovation. But that's perhaps the more tr most traditional role of government, but not necessarily the most important one. I believe that governments, that states, have tremendous potential for supporting social innovators with two things. First of all, as consumers, states, governments tend to be poor innovators. The public sector is slow to adapt to new solutions and slow to innovate. But we know very clearly what the problems are that we need to resolve, particularly in the social arena. And that is where the solutions that innovators come uh, that's where they, this needs to be an input for the public sector. Now that in turn requires innovation because a lot of the innovation, particularly market innovations, are conceived in the private environment and not in within the scope of public policy. But when a social in, uh, innovation is adopted as part of a public policy, it acquires a scale that makes things viable that in another context would not be viable. So therefore, as I think government, as a consumer, as a user of innovation to grapple with the social issues that we encounter every day is one of the opportunities for generating a much broader market for social innovators. But also to ensure that they can have the necessary scale for rollout, they can also encourage new innovators. Marcelo Brazil is a worldwide recognized leader across the region when we're talking about social innovators and social innovation. How do you see this relationship between government and social entrepreneur? What have you learned about that relationship so far? 
I think it's always a relationship where uh, of mutual dependency, uh, in the sense that you, you perhaps you don't have the m markets. You know, uh, the market cannot find by itself. You know, the necessary return. And when you're looking for social return, you have to have some sort of mechanism, you know, social targets. Um, what, uh, what I, you know, from before I went to the government from Getulio Vargas Foundation, uh, we designed programs uh, for the states and for the municipality at very low cost, reaching millions of people using the infrastructure set by the state, like Bolsa Familia. Yeah. So by like three months, you could reach one million people at a very, very low cost. Why? The infrastructure was already there. The challenge is how to allow the private sector to use this infrastructure because the state, the municipalities in Brazil was Rio, they could use that. So I think there is really a great opportunity to give you know, big jumps to reach the poorest of the poor, because in all over Latin America, you have conditional cash transfers. You know where the poor are, you know who they are, you have their address, you have a card, you have everything you need to use a good idea. You have to have, of course, a good idea, a good business model, but I think the infrastructure is there in a way that three, four, five years ago, it was not. Debemos entender and should we understand, and I ask Carolina and Marcelo to pipe in on this, should we understand, therefore, that governments are interested in having social entrepreneurs succeed? Is that a fact? Absolutely. As I was saying, in general, governments, I mean, we're not good innovators. And so, therefore, there is no better innovation than one that has been proven by the private sector. And going back to what Marcelo has just said, and if you remember, we met a group of ladies in Cusco who had received funding through conditioned monetary transfers, cash transfers, and they had subsequently then uh, found themselves in the innovative market, and they found a series of institutions that have designed procedures, institutions, so that they can then move into the private sector as economic players and work with them in terms of having credit and access to loans. So using the public sector to provide a certain economy of scale to these individuals is vital. Is vital. It doesn't mean that they are going to rise out of poverty, but it does give them tools which is competitive and allows them to operate in the marketplace and generate a market-generated response in terms of the products that are needed and demanded by a certain population. On the topic of whether governments are interested in their, the presence of social innovators, I think that is an interesting question that we need to look at a little more closely. If I I'm sitting in office and I look at Jordan's project, I have two choices. I can say, well, hmm, yes, there's a need. Why don't we go out and donate and just give away eyeglasses? And what is going to happen? I'll probably get a whole lot more votes. I will probably get a whole lot of applause. That's one option. The other option is to say, what do I need to do to change the regulations so that Jordan's business model can be successful? What do I have to do to create the incentives so that capital will fund a social undertaking such as Jordan's? So from my perspective, we should go down the second path. We need to see how we can cre create an environment so a social undertaking such as Jordan's can be successful and that it can be last over time, that it, has, it should be an economy of scale and so forth. But that's not going to get me a lot of applause. That is not going to get me a lot of votes in the short term. And so therefore, I think undoubtedly that we need politicians with a lot of courage to be able to take the path, which is not the obvious one. The obvious one is the first option, is to go out and give away glasses. So I think there has to be a much more in-depth analysis as to what the 
incentives of the government are so that these social innovators and entrepreneurs can exist. And I would hope and I would pray that there could be a, an understanding that with social in, innovation with, and that creating an environment for Jordan to succeed will lead to a much more equitable world with many successful social entrepreneurs who can satisfy the enormous needs that are out there. Yes, Marcelo. Of, of doing business, uh, doing social business, sí. how, to, how, how hard it is sí. to open a social business, to close one, so to improve the regulation. We really need to know uh, how to do it, and that's a practical question. I think, you know, the way you find as you go along the way. But I wouldn't discard, of course, I mean, the Brazilian government, so <laughs> I have to see from my side. But I think it's very hard in the private sector to have a scale. For example, Bolsa Família in Brazil, you, you, you spend 0.5% of GDP, you reach 45 million people. That's tough. That's yeah. tough to, you know, you have to have to, so, but how the private sector, once you sunk that cost, how can it, you know, uh, that, that's, that's, I think, it's the challenge, because you cannot compete with that. No one can compete, has this delivery possibility. So, and, and, and I believe very much in terms of competition, political competition across different sectors, you know, states, one state, do, a, a, you know, do an innovation and has incentive to talk with the private sector, to learn how to do it, because, you know, want to be, you know, want to be the president or, you know, so there is competition in a way, you know, so I think it's, uh, I, I, I wouldn't discard, what I would like to have is a race, you know, everyone running towards the same objective, which is to eradicate poverty. Hey, Carolina, déjame. Carolina, let me uh, just give Michelle the floor for just a moment. I would ask uh, to, you for your vision on this as, as well. First of all, let me note my admiration for the way that we, Jordan has described what social entrepreneurship is. I think that a lot of this, I mean, I, I get to be a little envious. In fact, I can see that there is enthusiasm and commitment here, not just a business plan. But in any case, I think the way that this sec the private sector perceives these types of initiatives, if you will allow me a, a certain approach to this, this allows for the creation of the middle class of the future. So it, it, it's not that we need to motivate people to do this. Uh, it's sort of a natural impulse to reach out to these people who don't have the means today, and if we can reach out to the middle class of the future, they can rise to that position. I don't have a solution, an immediate solution, to how the private sector can help this magnificent initiative. What I can say is that around the globe and that there are uh, insurance policies, and I say this not just because it's my area of business, but that that covers uh, the the cost of glasses. And I, I mean, oh, uh, and I, I do like this dichotomy of trying to figure out whether I should have micro insurance policies or whether I hand out glasses. I personally am convinced that even if it's the second path is much more complicated, I think it is a more efficient path to reach uh, this move to help move these people forward into a middle class that does not require social assistance. And last but not at least, it's also a phenomenal way of giving this middle class of the future an idea of insurance that is much more favorable than what we have in more mature economies. And again, I'm from the insurance background, so that's why I keep talking about that. Let me remind you that I will open up to questions, but let me go back to Michelle and then Carolina, and you're making me think about uh, 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 
assurance uh, insurance companies and reinsurance companies and, and underwriting firms and they're looking are you does this mean that you're looking at microfinance differently now and what is the vision and how did and when did you begin to change your vision when you're looking at these populations that are not being served this idea once again this uh, vision that it is an important step to make a more stable world a richer world and therefore a more promising world for all generations is perhaps more important for Latin America than for Asia because of the youth of Latin American democracy. But in any case, for what is truly a matter of passion in our industry is creating products that may be simple to sell, even though the technology behind them is complex. If there is an industry that needs to make an effort in this area, it's the insurance business. We will not uh, make all of the actuaries and actuarial tables in the world happy, of course not, but we need something simple, straightforward. That, to me, is a sine qua non of how we can win over this generation of the future, people who need glasses, people who need other things. And I think that in this regard, we as an industry, as an insurance industry, there's much more that we can do. And as an underwriter, we can support our insurance customers much more effectively. I think it's a very interesting uh, intellectual game. Carolina, yes, let me go back to this uh, topic of votes and the political economy uh, rather than the topic of the private sector participation in these sectors. I think one of the major concerns that we all have is in, the, in social policy is how long we will have sufficient resources to be able to hand out glasses or whatever good it may be. The only way to be able to ensure the sustainability of an intervention is that it comes from a viable business that has an entrepreneur behind it that makes who makes money with that intervention. Because otherwise, in the next crisis, in the next change of administration, uh, there, there will be a belt tightening measure and we'll lose that and you'll end up losing more votes than you gained when you started the program. Because when, when your role is to use the information and the resources of the state and knowing where people are who need X, Y, or Z, we can certainly make this information or the healthcare sector information as to what who needs glasses or who needs a a conditional cash transfer and so forth. It would probably facilitate the arrival of an entrepreneur such as Jordan to be able to provide that service, but it would also provide sustainability to the capacities and the capabilities of individuals to learn to be trained and to go to school and so forth. So I think the sustainability of these programs is also an underlying concept and an underlying component of what we need to do as states in our social policy in caring for the needs of the most vulnerable and most impoverished persons in our societies. And that's why the role of the private sector in sustainable business is vital to be able to uh, grapple with these needs because it doesn't matter what happens with public policy, they will continue to be served. You make me think of George and the eyeglasses. And in the case of George, that this was a life-changing experience also for the people who received it. But for the person who received the, these classes. But what happens if this person lives in an area that is far away from everything and they have problem in receiving food stuff, for example? So this would be a solution that goes halfway. So we are going to talk here about a comprehensive vision, which is very necessary when we are talking here about sustainable uh, social solutions. And I want to introduce someone who you're going to see on the screen in a second. He is Walter and he's a social entrepreneur who received the award last year. Uh, and uh, it, he was, uh, um, he received the award from Telefonica and he lives in Paramis actually. He's a leader of the community and uh, he lives close to another uh, village called Capachica. This village has 12,000 inhabitants and he organized the communities. This is the interesting point. He organized several people who live around Titicaca Lake. He organized five communities and on the basis of his experience with tourists, uh, French tourists in this case, he convinced uh, his community that they had to offer tourist services. 
he invited, therefore, these people to live with them and to work uh, in the fields and, for example, to prepare food stuff like quinoa. And now he is training uh, his communities to use Internet to open a page in Facebook and through Facebook to attract and communicate with European tourists who love to come to the Titicaca Lake and live with these communities. Walter does not have the technical knowledge that Jordan has, but he's a social entrepreneur. He also needs an ecosystem, and that is why it is so important to think of these other entrepreneurs. Alvaro, you have also mentioned this. The interesting thing is that he's not waiting for the government. He's a social entrepreneur. He is using technology, and he is changing the mindset of his communities. I would like to understand how a government, how a capitalist, and how a product that can be used by this kind of entrepreneurs and also for Walter, who is a social entrepreneur, can make a difference and can also scale up a project of uh, tourism like this one. There are families that had left and now they are going back to the region from Arequipa, for example. They are making a new start. There are different ways of supporting this kind of entrepreneur. The Peruvian government has given support to, to many such experiences of uh, tourism, not by giving them individual resources or offering them uh, venture capital, but by allowing them, for example, to visit other tourism experience of the sort so that they can benefit from mutual experiences and they see new ways of offering services. However, one of the big challenges that many social entrepreneurs face when they have this kind of tourism in rural communities, traditional indigenous communities in Peru, when they invite tourists to live with them, is that in their own communities they lack water and sanitation. And the government does not participate directly in their enterprises, but they can help them by improving sanitary conditions in their communities, because otherwise, sooner or later, these kind of experiences are going to collapse. Therefore, these are complementary tasks. and. What we need in this case is a combination of programs that somehow make up the puzzle so that these social entrepreneurs not only make money, but also they are able to teach others and to become an example for neighboring communities. also with uh, his whole environment to make it conducive and productive. I think it's a very, very, th that, I think that's the tough one for the private sector. And, and also how you attack, you know, a holistic approach. That's very hard also from the private sector, you know, because you want to explore a certain like glasses and things like that. So you, you have to have an integral approach to the to, uh, to the problem, and in, in my view, you know, I had an experience of evaluating many microcredit experience here in Peru, Mexico, Nicaragua. I was doing evaluation in Brazil, in my country, a big uh, program, and for my surprise, the most interesting one was this one, that was there in front of me, and new for ten years. So I think that perhaps Jordan should provide glasses for us as well, you know. <laughs> I think um, we, we, we say we are in the, you know, we are in the knowledge era, era do conhecimento, e eu creio que precisamos entrar na era do recu... I believe that we need to enter in the era of recognition to recognize, to recognize the success of people. The public sector and how it is it the interface between them. You have the scale, you have the innovation, how you combine that. You have like a snake with wings. You have to have a different type of animal. You're not going to find solution in one or the other. I think the best solution, especially in Latin America, you have big governments. We pay taxes for that. Yes. You're already paying for that, so you might as well take advantage 
but how you combine the private sector, ingenuity, you know, creativity, how to combine that. I think this is the, the challenge. Y el cómo, Michel. And how to do it to Michel, right? Yes, I believe that there's something that the private sector can do. Maybe this will not apply directly to Jordan's experience, but behind all these initiatives of social enterprises, the worst thing that can happen is a destructive event. And this we see in agriculture, for example, and also in some urban areas, when there is some destructive event that ruins uh, the work of 10 years, for example, an earthquake, a drought, a uh, flood, etc. Therefore, I believe that one of the aspects on which the private sector can intervene is to protect these people from this kind of disruptions, from what we call volatility. There's nothing worse with regard to these good initiatives to have an act of God and a natural event that destroys the work of many years just because nature decided it. Many things can be done in this regard, and I believe that governments can uh, add in their budgetary uh, measures some kind of insurance because it is possible to insure this kind of enterprises and to insure against Act of God also. In some cases in Latin America, we have seen some significant uh, losses, and many times uh, the um, victims, the first victims are those that are supported by this kind of uh, social initiatives. Well, Alvaro is going to give his advice in this regard, and then we will have a questions and answers session. You mentioned the case of a social entrepreneur. That's the case you presented. and. Uh, we must not forget that in any social innovation, the entrepreneur is at the center. We can see things from our perspective and think that we have to create, for example, experiential tourism. But we must not forget that in any successful project of a social nature, at the center is the entrepreneur. So we have to start asking ourselves how we can create a more conducive environment so that these entrepreneurs can develop. Innovation will be born from them, but we have to provide them with the necessary infrastructure and elements. So are you thinking of the government or you're thinking of doing it among uh, all of us? Well, all of us together, yes, that's the answer. We can't think that the government is going to solve everything or the private sector can do it. This is an error. What is required is cooperation among all so that we can put in place all the elements so that these social entrepreneurs are successful. And we can take many examples of uh, social enterprises that have succeeded. And in the end of the day, it happened because at the core there was a social entrepreneur that have the quality to push forward uh, these kind of projects. They are the ones that make a difference. Okay, I see that many people want uh, to ask questions now, so please use the microphone. First of all, I'm going to give the floor to the ladies. Please uh, state your name and uh, ask your questions very briefly, not comments, please, just questions. I have been very interested by the concern of the minister regarding scale because I'm Brazilian and Brazil is such a huge country. But I was wondering when we are thinking of scaling or giving scale to one enterprise or one solution like uh, uh, was the case with the eyeglasses or greater access to insurance policies, maybe we should have many different social solutions at a micro level along the line of what Alvaro said to a certain extent. For example, creating a group or a system. But what is your specific question? My question is, is it possible to think of uh, scaling not uh, one solution but social enterprises in a country because it may be the case of a child, like the one that was described, or another enterprise. 
is to have, you know, we are looking for social returns and in the long run, that's what we all want. So you would have some, to have some, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, system of social, everyone I think agrees that's on social targets, you know, like uh, if a kid, uh, you know, learns in school, that's a social benefit that will last for, for his whole life, etc. So I think we have to, to think in terms of system, systemic approach where, you know, you start to measure. Now, for example, in Rio, we, every two months, every kid do an exam. Math, science, ma uh, uh, Portuguese. Uh, so, you know, you, you can measure improvement. Uh, but I think, you know, taking his point, we be, I believe very much in reward social returns. The problem is that if you have a, a tragedy, you know, if the, the school gets flood, as so often happens, you have to have insurance. It's not easy, mm. but I think we, we have to have a system that looks for social return, and I think that's a role of the government. I mean, not a role, I, I think it has to be a joint to take your point, a joint construction. Between, but in, in the end of the day, you, can, you, you have to have everyone there, you know, and the government is the one who can give scale to this thing. And I think, you know, like places like this, the World Economic Forum is the place where you can diffuse this technology uh, worldwide or to, to many countries. Obrigada. Eh, Jordan, let me just give, yes, so that, yeah, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to, la voy a permitir, no sé por qué estoy hablando inglés, dos preguntas. I don't know why I'm speaking English. I'm going to allow two questions and then go back to the panelists. Alberto Franco, I'm a social entrepreneur from Mexico. Uh, this question is addressed to Carolina. We were talking about uh, uh, two different past votes or another path, which will be the right one, but I think that there's something in between. There may be, for example, a government that uh, opens a contest for social enterprises. And so what can you, tell you, uh, can, can you tell us about this plan you have and how can you be transparent and uh, have people participate with ideas, but that the people know from the beginning how these funds are going to be invested? One more question, please. Good evening. One of the main problems of the world is in order to ensure sustainability and continue with successful social practices are programs that leave aside party policies. I believe that the government has to follow these ecosystems to a certain extent. Is that your question? Yes. So I mean, how to support with resources. How can you face these problems? What we agreed yesterday in the Social Innovation Summit was that in the case of Peru that, that does not have a fund, either private or public, but small funds to support uh, social enterprises, mostly from uh, international donors is uh, that it is necessary to create a platform between the public and the private sector and join efforts with a, a body like the IDB that has expertise in order to create a mechanism to find solutions not by one by one as the previous question was asking but uh, by creating a platform that uh, gives an answer to social issues that are faced in any country and uh, this process has to be open and transparent and thus it will be able to gather many innovations but uh, the ones that win are not only the ones that obtain resources from these funds but also those that participate because those that do not win still get an idea about innovation and can benefit from mechanisms from which they can get support. So I believe that the government has to join the private sector because the expertise is very different in, in every case, the scale and the need to apply certain uh, social policies and also the need to sustain investments and also the expertise on innovation and the profitability of the businesses in the private sector have to be brought together. Both 
players have to be linked. Otherwise, the innovations will be very private and will have very little scale and will not reach their full potential. Or otherwise, the innovations will not be sustainable because they will always be subject to a political will or the existence of public resources. Therefore, if we combine both sectors, we will have the possibility of uh, giving the full potential, reaching the full potential of these opportunities. Jordan, you had a comment in this regard. So one more question because we're out of time. Comment on uh, scale as, as well as the question about having multiple interventions uh, rather than just verticalizing every intervention. In terms of scale, certainly that is the objective of any social enterprise because we're measured by how much impact we have. And unless we have scale, we're not going to have the type of impact that we are all setting out to have. However, I think there is a little bit too much pressure to scale too quickly. And a lot of social enterprises get into a situation because donors and others are measuring their impact and they're forcing them to scale. They often scale business models that are immature and as you scale an immature business model, you're digging yourself deeper and deeper into a hole. So scale is a good thing, but only once you've really developed a business model that truly deserves to be scaled and can, as it scale, gain power and not lose power. So that's just one comment on scale. The question of, uh, of other interventions or having a bunch of interventions, in this world, unfortunately, there's a lot of great innovations. There's microinsurance, there's eyeglasses, there's clean uh, water filters, there's cook stoves, and on and on, and treadle pumps. Part of the problem is the distribution of all of those things. So you can keep creating wonderful interventions that can make a huge difference in the lives of the poor. But unless you can get those products to the people who need it, it's really all for naught. I live in New York City and I liken it to the Lincoln Tunnel. Everyone tries to get to New York City through a two-lane Lincoln Tunnel and I'm in the eyeglass car and someone else is in the cook stove car and on and on. And really what we need the government to come in is make it a 14-lane tunnel rather than come, you know, help my intervention specifically get through. So the government really has, has to help with infrastructure and distribution uh, to enable a whole host of things to reach the populations that we're all trying to reach. Una última pregunta. One final question all the way to the rear, and then there will be time perhaps during the coffee break. I would like to wrap up with a final comment, but one final question. Thank you, Alejandro Villanueva from Televisa Foundation Mexico. I wanted to ask, when you talk about unleashing, about reaching out to millions, about you know, what is the role of the media in this, and whether we need to identify entrepreneurs or can people just be inspired to participate in this ecosystem? system. I think the, is the question for you or for, is that for me? For me? Very well. Jordan, do you want to answer the final question about uh, entrepreneurs first and then I'll wrap up? Because I'm not a social entrepreneur, but I do work in the media. Clarify the question. I want to make sure Absolutely. I understand it. Could you ask that question again? Are entrepreneurs, basically what you're saying, are social entrepreneurs born or made? That's the question? How to inspire people. Um, well, one thing that I would say, someone asked me an interesting question. Uh, when I was in Mexico, I was one of a dozen students on that trip. And they asked me, well, why did you continued that path, whereas most of the other folks on that trip went and opened up private practices in New York and Boston and so forth. And a lot of it had to do with having a prepared heart uh, and being open to an experience like that. Uh, I personally was uh, a mountaineer and I did a lot of work, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in vast wilderness areas. And in the first half of my life, the environments that I, I, I inhabited, if you will, uh, were telling me that I was dust in the wind, that I really had no purpose, mm. and had a very nihilistic approach or outlook to life. And then I came across this boy, and he showed me for the first time that I actually did matter.
And that was a really striking moment, but it wouldn't have struck me as powerfully if I wasn't prepared uh, for that moment, if I wasn't kind of looking for purpose, if I wasn't hungry to try to figure out um, what my role was in this greater world. So I think kind of having a prepared heart and mind uh, is really an, a critical component. Another critical component is to push yourself. I was born in the suburb of New York. What was I doing in rural Mexico? Um, and so to push yourself to experience things that you normally wouldn't experience in your life because one never knows what direction it might lead you to. Um, bueno, me dicen que tiempo... Very well. We've been told there is time for a final comment proliferating social innovation. I believe that we in the media have to tell these stories and many media, I mean, we're a pan-regional media, we have different initiatives that uh, we have, seen, we have Inside Africa, CNN Heroes, uh, just to mention a couple on CNN and uh, CNN in action, but we also have to talk about what the small-scale entrepreneurs are doing, not the large-scale ones, and not just the ministers or the great CEOs of companies, but also those that are working to directly and operationally with the individuals who are benefiting. I'm convinced that we need to help these individuals to talk more about their incredible platforms and take note of the things that are being done because it is important for us to, I mean, the way that we dis disseminate their effort is also important and social networks are also tremendous today for these purposes and we as a media and the social networks as well should have their own um, media-based ecosystem that they can work in, but sometimes we have to teach them how to work with a local radio station and, and Televisa, for example, at an event at ECLAG, an entrepreneur from uh, this is he, uh, uh, like asked me how to get to in contact with the Levisa and asked me for the formula for that. But in any case, there are many different types of circles and that expand as they grow. The last point is proliferating in this context of Latin America social innovation. One brief thought, one brief sentence from each of you. How do we do that? How do we expand? Alvaro. I think that undoubtedly we all have an inspiration to do good. I think there is a generational paradigm shift. Young entrepreneurs are seeing that having a purpose is a tremendous opportunity. And perhaps what I would recommend to young entrepreneurs here in this room and those who will be watching this show is just think about all those quality products and services that you use in your daily lives and see whether people in low-income sectors have those products and services. And if they don't, there's a great opportunity for business and for impact. Uh, two things. First, how we, I think, uh, communication is essential so we have not only a Jordan effect, you know, to propagate that, the example, I think this is, you know, evaluations I did, what, uh, there is this idiosyncratic thing which is that guy that starts everything, that, and that's very hard to replicate. So you, you may try to communicate that and so uh, this is the, uh, how you inspire people. I think this is a, a key thing and that's, um, that's the human side that's uh, very hard. And the second is, is the name of the Peruvian program, Juntos. I think that's a, a task for everyone. And just to comment her question, what I find really hard in the electoral market is when we are talking about children. Children yes. do not vote, yes. so it's really hard to get, you know, politicians to work for children for the future. That I find hard to do. So I think social targets. I think this is the is one way to try to 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 have longer horizon, 
to, you know, to not to be on the, first, the next election, but to have really long uh, term. The, 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 the long run in yeah. perspective. Obrigada. Jordan. Yes, um, it, it took us uh, 10 years to reach our first million customers. It'll take us two years to reach our second million customers. And that all sounds wonderful, but remember there's 700 million people who need glasses. So we haven't even made a tiny dent in the overall problem. And so Vision Spring and me personally, I'm, I'm moving away from just building the institution of a small social enterprise and really saying, how can we engage the business community? How can we engage the governments in order to scale, to make a true purposeful dent in this overall problem? We need a three-legged stool. We need social, the civil society, social entrepreneurs, but more importantly, in order for us to scale, we need the business community to engage with us, we need the governments to engage with us, and that's true for all social enterprises as they move from small kind of pilot programs to those that can affect massive change and impact. Thank you. Carolina, adelante. Carolina, I would build on the basis of what Jordan has said innovators, social entrepreneurs, there are many, and there will be many more. They don't need decisive action to continue to do what they do. The question then is, how do we ensure that we can replicate these individual actions or these small-scale actions and can reach out to millions and millions of people? And that requires that tie-in between innovators and the public sector. The innovators exist. The problems have been identified. What we need to do is move forward jointly so that these innovations translate into well-being, not well being overnight or the one shot opportunities, but something that is sustainable for the entrepreneur, for government, and for the population that provides continuous well being. Michel, a few final thoughts. I think the young generations of today and tomorrow, when they look at this vision 30 years ago, will be asking, why are you talking about social entrepreneurs? They're just entrepreneurs. And I guess the point is that we need to recognize that entrepreneurs come in many different flavors. They all take risks, but they are the ones who are preparing the future and laying the foundation for the future of this planet. And I think that in the future, the word social will disappear from this task and that it will be an exit and excellence. That would be an excellent signal. Thank you very much for this very worthwhile, rich exchange of experiences and discussions. I hope that this will be a second of many more opportunities like this in the future. Thank you very much for being with us.